The Leafs get embarrassed in Montreal while also losing a key defender to injury. And we have another trade to announce all this and more on today's edition of Locked on Leafs. Your Locked on Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Lockdown Leafs Podcast, one stop shop for all things Leafs. I'm your host, Mike DiStefano from TSN 1050 Toronto Radio, also known as Al's brother from TSN's Overdrive and TSN 1050's Leafs Lunch. With me, my co host of the Lockdown Leafs Pod, it's Dave Morsui from Sportsnet, also a writer for the NHLPA. And just a reminder, this is a daily Maple Leaf centric podcast, so be sure to subscribe to the show for free wherever you get your podcasts. You can now check us out also on YouTube. Locked on Leafs. We had a couple of our YouTube videos get into uh, get into the 200 view mark this week, Dave. So that seems to be growing, which is nice. So go check it out. Uh, we'd love to to you know increase those subs, increase those views. Um, it's you know you can just go and, and watch it in audio form or in video form as well. But as for today's podcast, Dave, probably going to be a little bit of a more solemn tone than we've had the last couple of days, where it's been uh, some you know. You, we're coming off of talking about trades, which was nice with Nick Ritchie. And actually, there's an update that we'll get to in today's show as well on one of the guys who came in that trade. But there was also another trade that was made today that we'll get to as well. But again, that loss to Montreal is exactly where we need to start. Five to two, you lose to the league's worst team, the worst team in the NHL. This is a squad, the Maple Leafs, who think that they are ready to compete for a Stanley Cup. Tell me, after the first 40 minutes of action tonight, how that team could possibly, possibly win a Stanley Cup this year, Dave. Please, show me. Explain to me. How I like. How am I wrong? Mike, I don't know why you're upset. I knew this was going to happen. This is why you set yourself up for it to happen so you're not pissed off or mad about the Leafs completely not showing up against the worst team I have seen since, what, the 2014 Buffalo Sabres? Dude, they're putting up they're putting up numbers that rival the expansion 2000 Atlanta Thrashers. That's how bad of a team this has been. They just got their 10th win tonight. We gave them their 10th win of the victory. They're like 50 games into the season. It's it's just bizarre how bad this team is considering they just came from a cup run, but it doesn't even matter. The Maple Leafs just there's they're living in Leafs brains rent free. Josh Anderson living in Leafs brains rent free out here doing Josh Anderson things, being the leaf killer, a couple of goals at an apple, few chances at the hat trick tonight and they sunk them. And 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 really what it was was just they got off to a really good start. They scored pretty early on and then they just kept the pedal to the metal in the Maple Leafs. I don't know what they were doing the first 40 minutes just swimming around. They weren't defending. Peter Morazic was just brutal in the first couple of periods there. It's like they they didn't show up in the game until about 8:30 at night as if they didn't know that the first half of the hockey game counted as if they thought it was an exhibition game and they were just, you know, all willy nilly didn't really give a damn. Meanwhile, you got this team who had just played in the night before they're in overtime. They went to overtime against the Islanders the night before and they come in and they spank them the first 40 minutes of the game. It was embarrassing, embarrassing to watch. You know, I, what I saw from the Leafs tonight, and it was something that pretty much carried over from the St. Louis game, which was, this team stinks at defending off the rush. I like, yeah, can't handle that speed. It was br- like I've it, it was bad before in that game against St. Louis. It was four out of the five goals came off rush plays. Four out of the five. You don't need any stats to tell you that because your eyeballs were on fire watching this Leafs defense try to stop the halves on the rush. Yeah. Like, and it's and it's curious because it's it's actually kind of Montreal's biggest strength is they do like to score off the rush a lot, but yeah, it, it's like it's not like the Habs ha- like they have some guys who got some speed, but they're not like all they're not known really as a team well, that's. Well, here's the problem, Dave. Here's the problem. The Leafs can't compete with a with a burly group that plays a playoff style game like the Calgary Flames. They're too tough. They can't play against that. 
The Leafs can't play against a team that has speed like the Montreal Canadiens or the or the St. Louis Blues. Their attack off the rush is just a little too strong for them, and they can't defend it. How the hell is this team going to win four rounds and win a Stanley Cup if they can't defend big teams and fast teams? Guess, guess what happens when you're going to play the Florida Panthers and the Tampa Bay Lightning? They're big and fast. Play the Pittsburgh Penguins. <laughs> Like it's, oh, this team, it frustrates me. This is how Dangle feels. This is why Dangle feels like this team is ruining your life. It's it's so frustrating when you can go out and you, one night you can have a great game, right? You go out, you dictate play, you beat the Penguins, and then you, you show up, you have a couple of stinkers the following nights and lose to the league's worst team in the Montreal Canadiens. I, oh, it was such a frustrating night. I mean, Peter Morazic. Why don't we start there, okay? Peter Morazic, I thought, was brutal. Probably his worst start as a Maple Leaf, I would say. Um, a few of those goals, you, you got to have, man. You got to have those goals. There was the one, the Caulfield goal, I think it was his first uh, his first one, where he goes and it was a one, kind of a one-timer, catches it from, from Anderson. I don't know if he lost track of where the net was behind him, but that dude was, I was actually texting with Frank Corrado, and I'll, I'll give him credit for this one. He was like, this dude was sliding into the stands to get a hot dog. He wasn't sliding anywhere near his blue paint. He was sliding to go get a hot dog in the concession stands. He was so far out of his net. It was ridiculous. And you saw that happen again. Uh, I don't. I think it was the 4 nothing goal. The exact same thing. Just overcommit on the slide. Lost track of where the pipes were behind him. And you had a wide open cage for these guys to score on, on the wide side. Yeah, no. Like, I think, yeah, that goal was pretty bad because he, he overcommitted. The goal against Hoffman, like that was a backbreaker because it was right through, him. right through him. Like it went right through him. Like people were like, oh, Timothy Lilligren, like, you know, he was kind of trying to figure out whether to, to play the pass or the shot. Like Hoffman had the worst angle to shoot that. He was literally shooting and hoping maybe for a rebound or something. And it, it just, too. came off the stick almost fluttering, was it not? Like, it did look a little bit of a knuckler, I guess. Yeah, maybe you could argue that, and it dipped at some point there, and that's why Morazic didn't yeah. quite get a piece of it. But I mean, that's a shot that that's a seeing eye shot from basically the half wall. You gotta have that. You gotta have that. And that was a bit of a backbreaker. Like you said, that was kind of it. That was what was that was that the three nothing goal there? The first goal in the second period. Like that was where Montreal said, okay, we didn't allow them to get back into it with their with them cutting the lead in half. Instead, we piled on. We made it three nothing. And the next thing you know, it was four nothing. And then really quickly, another two on one the other way, and it's five nothing. And it's like, what is going on here? Are these the Maple Leafs that I know about? Like they were playing like the Montreal Canadiens. Yeah. They're playing like the Canadians, and the Canadians, they didn't even, they didn't play that great, to be fair. I like, thought they were okay, but they weren't fine. I mean, Montembeau had to make some real good stops to keep this game in it tonight. Am I going to go as far as to say that the Leafs got goalied? I don't think Montembeau was that good. But early on, there was a couple of good chances. Like David Camp had a real solid chance. Happened to be the least first shot in the game like six minutes in, which is just gross. And that was a real good stop. Just make got a pad on it. There was another opportunity by Nylander. Makes the big save. So there was a couple of opportunities in the slot where Montembeau came up big to kind of keep the team, give them some energy. And, and that's something that they've missed was is getting saves a lot of the time for, for the goaltenders for Montreal. And Peter Morazic just, they literally just kind of swapped jerseys for the night. It, it, that's what it seemed like. The worst part about this, especially after the game, Sheldon Keefe says, I'm going to paraphrase what uh, James Myrtle tweeted out. Sometimes you need this type of game for a wake up. Sheldon, how many games have we seen from the Leafs that have been like this? You just had this two days ago against St. Louis. How does how is that not a wake up? Like this has to be the wake up losing to the Habs. Yeah, Calgary. Calgary was a bit of a wake up. Like I, the I mean, here's here's the thing that I look at that even like Seattle, like they won, but Seattle kind of outplayed them for a majority of that game, to be honest. But like if you're Sheldon Keefe. And all the time, people talk about it. If you have a game like this, I, I like to use the Jalen Hurts quote a lot, right? And if you guys aren't familiar with Jalen Hurts, quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles, he made a very famous quote where, you know, you, you have a bad game, 
It's like a deuce. You take a deuce, you don't look at it, you flush it, you move on, right? And and that's kind of how people like to now anecdotally talk about these games. But I don't know if you can really move on from this game. I think this this one kind of stings. And you got to fuel, use this as fuel to make sure that it does wake you up. And you do make sure that you get ready tomorrow night in Columbus. I mean, if they lose again tomorrow night in Columbus and they put forward a similar effort to what they did tonight, that's just not going to be good enough. And Montreal was on night two of a back-to-back. Now the Leafs are going in on night two, a little bit tired, a little bit shaken up from the night before. They're not going to have Jake Muzzin, who, by the way, uh, left the game with injury, if you missed it, um, and is staying in Montreal overnight. So he won't be at that game tomorrow night in Columbus. So they're already down a defenseman. Guessing Travis Dermott will fill in, or Ilya Labushkin, if he can get his visa situated by then. They're hoping so, but it's not a guarantee. You know, like tomorrow night, now you're going in. at first, You get this win tonight, you feel confident. Now you go in tomorrow and it's like, geez, this might be must win or else things might slide here if you're if you're Toronto. Yeah, I, I honestly a loss tomorrow would just it's it we compounding like they 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 said all the right things said I mean the Leafs players were saying the right things that you know we have to do better of defending off the rush. They even like pinpointed like off the rush as being something they need to fix. Yeah. If they come out against Columbus and Columbus dominates with chances off the rush and scores. What does that say to like the mentality of the group in that they know what the issue is? Okay, if they don't solve it, that just shows like that it's it, the effort isn't there to make it a point to try to to fix it. Well, it's interesting because like if you're trying to break up the rush, then basically you got to clog up the neutral zone and you got to try and get sticks on puck as they try and break in over the blue line, right? I did see that happen a little bit tonight. Like you saw on the one goal, it might have been the first goal there, like Morgan Riley kind of went to go and pinch on a a puck in the neutral zone or pinch on a puck up around the point. It kind of was bouncing on him, and then it gets right past him, and away they go on a two-on-one, right? So, you know, there's some pros and cons to it as well because if you go and, and they get past you, or you fumble the puck and they get past you, now all of a sudden it's not just like a a rush chance, but it's a two-on-one and you're leaving your defenseman out to dry. And we saw that happen, gosh, I I think three of the five goals were just odd man rushes. Not just rush chances, but just straight up odd man cross ice rush goals. You know what I mean? Like one-timers and yeah, even I'm looking, David Alter just tweeted out Morgan Riley speaking afterwards on scoring chances off the rush against. And he said, quote, I think as a group, we're obviously going to have to look into that more. It's a common theme. And yeah, you're right. This is a common theme. This was an issue in St. Louis, and it's a persisting issue here tonight again in in Montreal. And bringing in Ilya Labushkin, um, he's in the, you know, almost in the top third in the league at defending, uh, denying zone entries. So maybe that is a guy who can help you out, I suppose, in that regard. But, you know, I'm not you can't look at Labushkin as the guy who's going to turn things around in that spot. You need your Morgan Riley's. You need your TJ Brody, who didn't have a terrific game tonight. You need Jake Muzzin. Hopefully he can get healthy and help out. You know, Lilligran was exposed multiple times tonight. You need everybody to kind of buy in and play a little bit better because what they got as a, as a, as a team, not just even the defense, but as a team defensively over the last couple of games in that regard has been good enough. It just has not been good enough. Um, there was a trade that was announced actually <laughs> midway through the first period by the Toronto Maple Leafs. When we get back, I'll dive into it and let you know exactly what the trade is and what it actually entails. Cause it's not as big a deal as some people are making it seem out there on Twitter. So I'll explain what I think is, is a foot here in Leafs nation with their newly acquired goaltender. But before I do, uh, let me tell you guys about betonline.net. Football might be over for the season, but basketball is full steam for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fire coach is going to land, betonline.net is your number one spot for all your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC right to your favorite Vegas casino games. You can head to the website today and use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action bet online it's where the game starts 
Welcome back into the Locked On Lease podcast. Mike DiStefano here alongside. I've got Dave Morissuti. Uh, you can catch me out on Twitter at Mickey underscore Canuck. Dave at D underscore Morissuti. Or starting next Tuesday. So we're not going to start this today. But starting next Tuesday, we're going to start doing a weekly segment called Twitter Tuesday where we take questions from you, the listeners. So you can either... Put it in the comment below if you're on YouTube, which, again, you can go check us out on YouTube as well for the, the podcast. Or if you're listening, hit us up on, on Twitter, either myself or Dave, or better yet, every Monday or Sunday night, we're going to be sending out a, firing out a tweet from our Locked On Leafs Twitter page, and you can answer the questions or ask the questions off of that uh, Twitter post that we mentioned asking for those cues from you guys. So it's a chance for us to, to answer the, you know, the, the questions that you're wondering about Toronto with the trade deadline coming up. I know you definitely are going to have a lot of questions for us. So uh, make sure that you're, you're keeping an eye on, on it on Twitter, go follow us and uh, make sure that each and every Tuesday you can participate in Twitter Tuesday. Uh, but for today, I think I think we got to close the book on the Leafs Habs game here. Um, they do play Columbus later tonight, so we will tee up that game in just a moment. But before we get there, there was a trade that went down in the middle of the first period, which uh, caught me off guard, Dave. I don't know about you, but certainly wasn't thinking we would see it. I'll be completely honest with you. So I was just kind of perusing Twitter during the game, as I usually do. Um, I actually have like notifications when the Maple Leafs PR sends out a tweet that goes to my phone. I thought it was a fake account. I had to check it and then recheck it to make sure that the notification was there because it came across my screen. Maple Leafs trade for Carter Hutton from the Arizona Coyotes for future consideration. So Carter Hutton, goaltender, 36-year-old veteran goaltender from the Arizona Coyotes coming to Toronto for future considerations. Well, it's not quite as it seems, Dave. Not, not savior. Not this is not the savior trade you're looking for. No, well, it's it's not the savior trade you're looking for at all. And I saw people saying, "Oh, you need to, you know, improve the defensive depth." What are you doing, adding another goaltender? I have a theory, Dave. I have a theory about this trade. Okay. I think this is an extension of the Nick Ritchie deal that went down over the weekend. If you look at the kind of the events that have occurred over the last 24 hours. Hutton was placed on waivers yesterday and cleared today. So because of that clearance, he was not taken. I think, I believe there is a handshake deal, a wink, wink, nudge, nudge that if Carter Hutton goes unclaimed, we will trade for him because he's on a one way contract. So the Yotes are on the hook for that full cap hit. I think it's only like 750,000, but we know about the Arizona Coyotes and how much of a, a you know a cap team they are on the down on the bottom side. Um, so I what I think is they said okay if he clears, we'll take him on. Um, I want to give you future considerations, which probably means if he plays games for the Leafs, it'll be like a sixth or seventh round pick. Uh, future considerations could mean anything. That no one's heard of. Exactly. It basically just means here's this guy. And I was proven right, I believe, because then Craig Morgan, who's a great reporter for the Arizona Coyotes, um, he's uh, of, of the Athletic, reported that although Hutton has been traded to Toronto, he's actually going to be staying in AHL Tucson. Um, and so that's where he's going to play. He's been loaned to Tucson instead of reporting to the Marlies. And that made a lot of sense to me because when I saw this trade come down, I'm like, okay, one of two things, either, you know, there's an injury to Jack Campbell. We don't know about it. There's a potential trade of Peter Morazic and we don't know about it. And this is, I guess, insurance, or this is just part of, you know, an extension of the Nick Ritchie trade. And this is literally just them taking on his money um, because he's cleared waivers and he can be sent down to the minors and it's not a big deal. And that's what I think happened here, in my opinion. I also just think that uh, Arizona is trying to relieve themselves of contracts because I think they're planning to take on more contracts as they get close to the trade deadline, more prospects that are maybe signed to NHL contracts that they need to make sure they're not close to that 50 limit. But yeah, I know I, 
like when I saw, I said, to, like when I saw the card and Hardy trade, I said, there's, "There's this is not a trade for the Leafs, like for him to play with the Leafs. It's either he's playing with the Marlies because maybe there's an injury there, but I didn't see anything there, or yeah, this is some sort of, as you said, like an extension of that Nick Ritchie trade because we know that the Leafs, uh, you know." the whole reason for having the Nick Ritchie trade was trying to not only get players, but to get some cap flexibility and with Hutton clearing waivers, that cap flexibility is still there. It's just now the Leafs take his contract onto their books versus Arizona having that contract on their books, which they don't want for obvious reasons. I think they're planning some moves and they need that, that contract flexibility as well. The Arizona coyotes. Yeah. I mean, yes, I think that that would make some sense. Um, they're going to be moving out a lot of players and bringing in a lot of picks. So I don't really know exactly if they're going to be doing a whole lot of like if they, they need do like contract spots there and they get three players back. That's three players back or two players back. Like you have to figure the math there in that regard. Right. I think that's I that's my only assumption for them just getting rid of a contract. But this could also just be. We don't want to pay Carter Hutton to play in the AHL. Well, that's what it is. So they told the Leafs, like, we can either include him now, or if he gets claimed off waivers, perfect. Neither of us have to worry about him. But if he clears, then we will trade him along with this Nick Ritchie deal, or else we're not making the deal. And they said, okay, fine, whatever. We'll pay off the remainder of his contract, and he can remain in Tucson in their AHL squad. Because at the same time, I don't think I want him playing here because you you want Justin or you want Joseph Wall to keep getting some time in the AHL. You know you've got uh, Eric Colgren getting some time developing decently, the Swedish goaltender in the AHL. Then you've got Ian Scott in the ECHL. Why would you bring in Carter Hutton? You know, so y- you just leave him in that system. It doesn't bother you, and it was just a way to kind of make all parties happy with the Nick Ritchie deal. And because I mean, realistically. It, it was a big win for Toronto. Even if you add in Carter Hutton into that deal, you still win by bringing in Labushkin. Yeah. No, because you're getting a player that helps you versus a player that you're, you know, having to have this cap hit on that is not playing for you. You don't want in your lineup and you're trying to find, a, you know, something that works for you. The Zingle would have been, a, I think, I mean, considering the, his play and his ability would have been fine in this lineup. But gaining that cap relief also works too because they not only accrue cap space, but they can go out and add a player and not how and, and they can actually now bring Rasmus Sandin back too. That's the other thing. That too, but hang on. So Ryan Dezingle is interesting because I saw Kevin McGrand. I think it was Kevin McGrand. One of the Toronto reporters tweeted this out when Dezingle got claimed by the San Jose Sharks. So um, that was the, kind of the big thing. Dezingle got placed on waivers yesterday. The Leafs were hoping to sneak him through and then allow him to just be on the AHL and just be depth for this team. He ended up getting claimed by the Sharks, and now he's a member of the Sharks organization. So everyone's saying, okay, you got that cap off the books. He only made $1.1 million. That, co- that cap was fully variable in the minors. So it didn't even matter. That cap was not there. It was inexistent anyways. So losing to Zingle isn't, hey, you lost $1.1 million off of your cap. You can accrue more cap space. It actually didn't matter whether he – got claimed or not they still had the same amount of cap and will accrue the same amount of cap i actually saw a uh okay so i'm gonna find this tweet here that explained i think it was from puckpedia that explained the cap hit for these two players so um whether you do i think we're still gonna see a lot of paper transactions to try and accrue more cap space as we go so whichever one between lilligren and sandine aren't playing in those games will um will allow you to get some more cap space. So uh, the tweet says every day that Lilligren is off of the Leafs roster, it saves him $4.3 thousand dollars, which could be worth as much as an additional $21,000 at the deadline to their AAV for Sandine. It's four and a half thousand up to 22.4 thousand in AAV. Now that doesn't sound like a whole lot point, you know, point two two you know, literally $22,000 when you're talking about a sport that has an $81.5 million salary cap. But if we know anything about the Leafs, like it's all about nickel and diming. I think last year they were like 
$5,000 within the salary cap after making the Felino deal and all those other deals. So you may snuff and be like, oh, they're saving $22,000. Ooh. I mean, that's the difference between being able to make one more addition and not. You know, being able to make that one final tinker around the edges and not. Is that going to be the difference between getting a Claude Giroux or a Jacob Chikrin or, you know, a Ben Sherrod or one of these other big time pieces you're hoping to get? No. But it could help with this team trying to add depth. So don't snuff at these, uh, you know, paper transactions that the Maple Leafs are doing between now and the deadline. Don't get weirded out if you see Lilligren or Sandine being demoted or sent down to the AHL. This is all Brandon Pridham and Kyle Dubas using their collective genius hockey minds and in a way circumventing the cap and figuring out a way to accrue as much space as possible so that they have the most cap space possible come March 21st at the trade deadline so they can make another deal. Cause I don't think we're not happy if it's only Labushkin, it, no. it's gotta be something else. Something else has to come down. And you saw it tonight. This is not a team as constructed, especially if Jake, uh, Jake Muzzin's injury is, is long-term. This is not a team constructed to go a very long way here. If, uh, if they don't make another sizable addition to this defense. Yeah, no. And I think when you look at, I mean, would Rasmus Sandy have looked good in the lineup tonight over the other guys? Probably. But, you know, the Leafs are definitely thinking the long game here in that in that regard. Like, you kind of hope that a game against Montreal, you don't – you can go with the Travis Dermott or Justin Hall and not be worried about your defense as much. Well, that kind of proved to not be <laughs> the right call in that regard. But then, you know, you have Columbus the next day. I don't know how that's going to work out. You know, I, I, I know Keith said that if Lubushkin skates and he looks okay, he'll be slotted into the lineup. Well, I think did he was there an update after the game tonight where he talked about that? Yeah, he did say that he'll be at the morning skate and they're going to give him a look and then uh, they'll decide after the morning skate whether they're okay. Gonna so his visa is all all clear. Yeah. It's all good. To, okay, because that was the last update that I heard from him um, yesterday. Yeah. or this morning was, or maybe it was yesterday, that they are going to make sure that his visa is all up to date and he was going to join the team in Columbus, but it was unknown if he was going to be able to play due to visa issues. Uh, but if that's been solved and he's expected to be in the lineup tomorrow, could have come at a more perfect time, especially since Jake Muzzin's not going to be in it. Why don't we take one more uh, quick break, and when we get back, let's get into this game tomorrow uh, tonight, I guess at this point, uh, against the Columbus Blue Jackets. We can kind of tee it up, see what maybe the defensive pairings will look like without Jake Muzzin. Uh, talk about Campbell getting back in the net and a red, red hot blue jacket that you may not realize how red hot he is, but could pose to be a bit of a problem tomorrow. And we'll talk about that next. All right, welcome back into the Locked on Lease podcast. Uh, Mike DiStefano here. Uh, alongside my good friend Dave Morissuti, uh, Maple Leafs going up against the Columbus Blue Jackets tonight. Uh, just a reminder that the Lockdown Leafs podcast is a daily Leafs podcast, which you can find uh, anywhere you get your podcast from. Also, now you can find it up on YouTube. And uh, Dave, are we gonna are we gonna give the awkward YouTube wave to our YouTube friends? There it is, really awkward wave. Go ahead. And go and join us on uh, on the YouTubes if you want to see how awkward that wave actually looked. Um, but yeah, coming into tonight, Leafs and Columbus. Look, Toronto now loses of two straight. They haven't looked good in those games either. You got to think that this the, the 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 Maple Leafs need to come out firing tonight, like for real. They're going to have to have a real solid game um, right out of the gates. You got to think, no, like if, if they come out flat like that, that, that would not be, I mean, if you're a Leafs fan, you'd be really annoyed if they don't come out strong because they, they, they couldn't have had a worse start against Montreal. You know, you saw how they played against St. Louis game down to nothing. And then, you know, you would think that the Pittsburgh game was going to kind of be the start of something a little bit better, right? Where they kind of, get the confidence and get started early. Literally Matthew scoring within the first, you know, 30 seconds of the game. So, yeah, I mean, the start means so much for the Leafs. I think it kind of gets overlooked in sometimes. Um, 
So I, I think the Leafs need to play with a little more conviction at the start. Um, and, you know, I, I'm wondering if maybe Sheldon Keefe makes so, some adjustments to the lineup as well. Ooh, adjustments like as in what? Dave? That's a harsh line. He he called them out a bit. He kind of said that, that was a, they were outworked after the game. And I think... That line I thought was going to get off. You know, they, I thought because Nylander did so well against St. Louis, this was going to be the start of something. But defensively, they were just not very good. And I think I'm wondering if he tries to make a move. You know, the the third line wasn't too bad against Montreal. The fourth line was pretty good. I think, you know, you kind of reward those guys a little bit and, you know, kind of change things up because that second line needs some work. Yeah, you know what? It's it's unfortunate because they seem to have been building a little bit. I thought that they had, um, you know, a, a solid game against Seattle, and then they had a, a Willie obviously scored two goals the other night. I uh, thought they played well against Pittsburgh, and then tonight, dud, just the big old dud. So that's interesting. I here's my issue. I don't really know who they could put on that line to spark this club. Like, are you trying to split up that top line? Probably not. No. So who do you really, who do you put there? Like, just you, like you put Micaiah back up there, give him an option. Do you flip one of Nylander or Kasha on their off wing and then play Kasha, Tavares and Nylander and see whoever plays the left and the right or Pierre Engvall is another uh, option as well. He scored a goal tonight. Um, you know, he can play, uh, you know, like, I, I don't know. He's not a great option, but he is an option, potentially, as a guy who you could play up in the top six. Um, I just don't know exactly who you fit there. It's almost as if now the conversation is shifting from just, okay, you need to add a defenseman to maybe you also need to look to get an addition into your top six, the way that this second line has struggled over the last little bit. It wouldn't surprise me. I mean... I, I think to say that the Leafs had only one issue going into the trade deadline, I think we we're trying to pick the more important issue versus what the Leafs needed to do, right? Mm-hmm. Like we know how badly they need that that top four defenseman, but it would be great if they could add that second line left winger. I think that's really the spot that they could use some depth. And a guy that's a little bit better defensively can kind of drive play a little bit more too. Cause yeah, you bring up those third, those middle six off, like the third and fourth line options. They're not bad, but you know you kind of like them in the spot that they're in, right? So maybe you bump, you get somebody that's more capable of playing in that second line role, you know, and then and maybe that jolts something a little bit different. That that's that's the question. That's really the big question I have there. You know, um, well, they've tried Ilya Mikheyev, and Sheldon Keefe says he didn't think it played over very well he didn't like it as much as he thought he would or as much as they thought they may when uh when that became a possibility i guess in in the off season um or in, in the preseason where they Even thought maybe he came back from his injury he was pushed up there too a little bit a little bit i i just i don't see exactly how they're gonna like they don't really have anybody I, the best case scenario actually nick robertson comes up right like if, if nick robertson could prove to be a, a helpful addition in this top six maybe is he better than kerfoot at this point i don't know but i mean he's cheap <laughs> it's an option yeah because a lot of people are kind of like you know oh if they need to trade nick robertson to get that you know big big piece of the deadline just like you know, but I, I, it'd be a shame to kind of get rid of Nick Robertson before he gets his real shot with the Leafs. You know, he just he's just getting his stride back with the Marlies. He's been playing pretty well, um, you know, from what I've been seeing there. And you know, you kind of want to that he's he was I think kind of a guy they were looking at as a potential answer to that top six. He was going to kind of be that guy down the road that would be able to provide a, something different and. Maybe it happens. I think they kind of want to give him more time with the Marlies, and maybe that changes their thinking at the trade deadline. Maybe they feel like, eh, I don't know if he's ready yet. Um, 
uh, that's why the next month is going to be cr- like less than a month is going to be very crucial for him. Not only play well, but to stay healthy because that's been yeah. his biggest problem. Yeah. So I don't know if we'll, we'll see a, a big shakeup in the top six tomorrow, but hopefully they can definitely rebound because the game against Montreal was, was brutal. And, and Sheldon Keefe said as much himself that they got outworked and it just wasn't a real so- solid game out of anybody in, in the opening, like, 40 minutes really like up until the the third period the third period they woke up but they got to come out and play a lot better and a lot harder for uh for themselves against columbus we were speaking about this before we took a break um jake muzzin's not going to be trolling with the team to to columbus so now we get to think about okay so without jake muzzin what will this new look new revamped defensive unit look like because well let's assume that Labushkin does indeed end up back in uh end up playing tomorrow, which probably seems likely that that'll happen. Here's how I think the lines shake out. You tell me if you think you like it or if you try something different. But Riley Brody, obviously, you don't mess with your top pair there. Sandine Labushkin as the second pair, and then Dermot and Hall as the third pair. Yeah, I was like, because I'm like, you're not, <laughs> this is funny, because like, you're going to have three right shots in the lineup after we had this conversation not so long about not having enough right shot defensemen. But yeah, it'd be one of the right shot that would be coming out. And I think Lilligren would be, I mean, if you're going to bring Sandine up, you can send Lilligren down. So right. you can, it's an easy paper transaction there. Um, and yeah. you back. so, you know, he'll be fresh. Right, you'll have fresh yeah. legs in both Sandine and Labushkin, whereas both Derman and Hall played tonight. And yeah, didn't play well either. No, and you know I like, yeah, and I think you don't want you don't want to put Travis Derman and Justin Hall in a tough spot where they're playing it more. But if you bring in Labushkin, he's been playing like what eighteen minutes a game for he's Arizona. Playing, yeah, he's been playing like their top pair alongside Jacob Chikrin, so he's used to playing. You know, yeah. 18, 19, 20 minutes a night. And Rasmus Sandin can take some minutes as well, right? And I actually would be very curious to see how that pairing would work, right? And yeah, yeah so I, I don't disagree with that. The real question is whether they'll bring up Rasmus Sandin. It would make the most sense. Yeah, I would yeah. think so. Um, even I don't know if what his I because I know he was staying. I don't know if he stayed in Toronto or if he traveled the team because I know he can still kind of be around the team or something. Mm-hmm. Um even if he's not with like, he's not called up. So I I'm very curious to see how that works. I mean, we'll find out in the morning when morning skate happens uh, right. and we see who, uh, how the lineup uh, shakes out. Yeah. So I guess we'll see, but I'm hoping that's the case. I, I think the injury to Muzzin definitely. That changes. That changes, changes things, kind of thinking. Definitely. Right. And it, you kind of do need that other left-hand shot now. And, and Sandine is probably the guy you need to bring in there. And Labushkin. Now, all of a sudden, it's like, okay, we can use another body here. So if you're here and you're able to play, let's get you rolling right away. Let's see. Let's see. The, the... By the way, I was speaking with Tyson Nash today on uh, on Leafs Lunch, and I asked him, remember he had the nickname the Russian Bear? Yep. So I asked him where that nickname came from. Apparently, he gave him the nickname. He's like, it, yeah. it does not surprise me one bit. Tyson Nash is great. I love listening to his calls, like if I ever see yeah. him, you know, he's, uh game he's his calls are great so it does not surprise me if he was given the name the russian bear from tyson nash yeah so i guess well they used to call luke shen the dancing bear for whatever reason so then when he took over like the luke shen role they started calling him the russian bear and he's like it it fits because the the style of games he plays like a bear he mauls you and i like to hear that i could see them going out there and go maul some blue jackets players tomorrow night because there wasn't much mauling going on today in front of the net, in front of Mrazek against the, the Montreal Canadiens. But hopefully Jack Campbell can have a better fate tomorrow with the guys out in front of him. He gets the net. He'll look to rebound off of a tough start as well in St. Louis. The least they'll try to snap a two-game skid. But the player on the other side who I kind of teed up and said is red hot right now. and You may not even know how hot this guy is. But in those last, he's currently riding a nine-game point streak. He's got 10 goals, eight assists, 18 points in these nine games. Dave, do you know who that player is? Oh, man. I was wondering, was it Patrick Laine? Patrick Laine. I did see he's been 
playing. I, I saw the game when he scored against Montreal and just like, oh, there's a Patrick line that we were expecting to see. Got a hat trick the other night in Chicago. He has in his last nine in this nine game winning streak. He has seven of his last nine games have been multi point games. Wow. He scored six. He scored. There was a a, a three straight games. He scored twice um, against Montreal, Florida, and then Washington. And then he scored a hat trick the other night in Chicago and two assists yesterday in Buffalo. So, you know, Patrick Line is starting to heat up. So that's something to kind of watch when you're uh, when you're out there for the Maple Leafs. So maybe if you are looking to place a wager at BetOnline.net, maybe a player prop for. Line A to score a goal. He seems to be scoring in bunches right now. So you might be able to, to pick that up at a decent price if if Vegas hasn't quite uh, picked up on it. Maybe betonline.net hasn't picked up on it yet. I don't see, as of now, the, uh, the, the prop bets aren't there. But they'll be there in the morning by the time that this podcast comes out. So if it's a good price, I mean, Patrick Line is filling the net. So... Um, it might, might be worth a bet over at betonline.net, but, uh, Toronto favored to win the game as well. Uh, looks like they're favored by what I see it minus 220 on the money line. Dude, they were minus 400 on the money line and lost that game against Montreal. So <laughs> what does that, uh, what does that tell you? But they're, they're favored on the money line. They should win this game. They're clearly the better team when it comes to them. Uh, between the two, I mean, you look at Columbus and they're giving up actually 3.7 goals per game, 31st in the league in goals against per game. Wow, that's bad. They're giving up the most shots against per game. That all screams, just screams Toronto success. Toronto should be able to pick on them, but will they? Will they be able to do it is the question. They didn't do it in Montreal when they had clear advantages. Dude, Montreal is one of the worst penalty kill teams. They didn't score on the freaking power play and the multiple opportunities that they had. But can they take advantage where they have the advantage tonight in Columbus? That's the question, Dave. Can they do it? They need to. They got to. Oh, yeah, they do. I'm curious to see who gets the net for uh, Columbus as well. I know Jean-Francois Berube was... Uh, in net in their last game against uh Chicago or sorry Buffalo, Buffalo and he came and they came away with the win and he hadn't played in like oh, what, a thousand days or something like that in the NHL as of now it seems like the likely starter is uh Merzlikens Merzlikens because Corpus Allo is still injured yeah so I I think it'll be Merzlikens and he's he's had some struggles like Columbus they've scored a lot but they've also as you said they've given up a lot of goals so it favors the Leafs if this is going to be a high-scoring, back-and-forth offensive type of game uh, because now this is not the Torts Columbus team that we have seen in the past in terms of defensive play. So it should – I think this is a game that I'd be a little more comfortable you know, betting on the Leafs if you're going to look to place a little wager. I would say so. I kind of take the over if you're looking uh, for – if you're not want to put it on the Leafs, take the over. I think this is a, a – a, prime game for someone yeah. to put up a lot of goals. Yeah, the over is 6-2 and 1 in the last 9 meetings in Columbus between these two squads and uh looks like the Leafs, yeah, 8 and 2 their last 10 is the favorite. So it looks like, you know, a lot of a lot of betting trends you know, going towards Toronto, but a lot of trends also went towards Toronto in the game against uh, in the game against Montreal. But last time these two teams played, it did go over. It was a five four Maple Leafs final. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what ends up happening there. Uh, but it should be a good game. Hopefully, the Leafs come back and and get back back to the way that they can play, back to the way that we know they know how to play. I went a little overboard earlier, saying this team can't do anything. Look, at the end of the day this team is still on pace to break their own franchise record for points in a season. They're still a very, very good team. They're going to make the playoffs and they're going to put up a fight against whoever they play. But boy, can they ever drive me crazy on nights like tonight. And hopefully, you know, one night of sleep, they don't have to think about it too, too long. They can get back at it, get back on the horse and get back to the winning ways tomorrow. And then uh, kind of set them up for, for good, final end of the month because they got a lot of games coming up this uh this final stretch here i think it's like five and five games and eight nights or something like that in the final 
week here in, in the short month of February. So it's going to be a jam packed schedule uh, for the rest of the month. And then next thing you know, it's trade deadline and we'll see what this team, the final product of this team looks like, uh, but that's into it for us here today on the show. Um, I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can find it and subscribe to the Lockdown Leafs podcast on all podcasts and platforms and re- receive daily Maple Leafs content Monday to Friday. Follow myself on Twitter at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow the show at Lockdown Leafs. And follow Dave at D underscore Morissuti. And as always, go check us out and subscribe to us now also on YouTube. We'll be back to break down the game tomorrow night against the Blues, uh, the Blue Jackets, and the Maple Leafs. And Dave, let's hope that it's a better result tomorrow. That's going to do it for us here today on the podcast. Until next time, keep it locked right here on Lockdown Leafs.